Brothers Off-Road. Today, we are checking out my blood, sweat, and tears. The Red TJ, you guys have seen it for two years. Had a ton of questions about the way that we done stuff. Tons of questions about the parts that we use. So we're why gonna we check it out, why we did it, the inspiration behind it, the history of Peck Brothers, all in this video today. Don't go anywhere. My name is Caleb Peck. And these are my two brothers, Brady and Alex. We were raised in the back seat of a Jeep. And ever since we were little kids, we've been obsessed with anything that has to do with off-road. Since we were old enough to turn a wrench, we've been building our own Jeeps. And all the building, buying, selling, and wheeling has kept us close through the years. So here we are telling our story in hopes to inspire others to get off-road. You're watching Peck Brothers. nothing we're not wheeling but in this video you'll hear some of the most important things to me that I've ever done in my life this Jeep has been my blood sweat and tears we did all right for a couple of goofballs <laughs> I want to show you in detail what's been going on in the Peck Brothers garage for the last two years it all started with a young man that had a dream <laughs> What was his name? His name was Caleb. Here's the thing, when I was 13 years old, both my older brothers had Jeeps, and I was so jealous I couldn't even hardly breathe, and I wanted one bad. So I sold my dirt bike, we found a screaming deal, and I bought this first Jeep, and that's kind of where it all started. And I bought and sold and fixed and sold a couple of Jeeps, and when I was 15 years old, I started my very first ground up build. I put so much work into that Jeep. We built that Jeep for almost nothing. I was in high school. I didn't have two nickels to rub together. And somehow we threw a Jeep together. And it looked like my brother's Jeeps, but it just didn't, it just didn't perform like them. It just didn't have the, you couldn't go fast in it. You couldn't hit something really hard. It had leaf springs. On Dana 60s, I had 42 inch tires. I even had a 6.0 LS motor in it. But I couldn't do what my brothers were doing. I, I couldn't get extreme with it because I was inverting shackles, blowing beads. I just, I wanted something that I could push harder. I wanted to go fast. And so I decided that all of the stuff that I'd have to do to this Jeep to make it do the things that I wanted it to do was gonna cost more than it was worth. So I sold the Jeep and I got my money out of it and I put it all into this Jeep. Get out of here. Oh yeah, yeah. We were on our way out to Oklahoma. Picking some parts up, because Brady was buying some stuff, I was buying some stuff. We drove clear to Oklahoma from Idaho. It took forever. If you haven't seen that, we made a video about going to Oklahoma. Halfway there, we're on Facebook Marketplace. I'm looking for a Jeep, I don't even have a Jeep. And I find this Jeep in Colorado Springs. It had a bad four cylinder motor. The guy was super cool, he texted back super quick. We ended up picking it up, long story short. In Oklahoma, we got the motor and transmission transfer case, hard tech junk in the back. And the front end, and a couple of other parts. So at this point, we were at the design phase. That's where you gotta decide what exactly you wanted to do, what you wanted to do well, what you're right to sacrifice on. We decided we wanted to run 43 inch tires. 
We wanted to have mechanical steering so it would drive down the road good. We decided that we wanted to do a custom frame so we could have more up travel in the front and rear and it would sit really low. We had to decide all these things at the very beginning. So I knew I needed tires. And at this point, I had a couple of clams still in my bank from my old Jeep being sold. Jumped on Facebook Marketplace. I was all over all of the groups, all the pages, trying to find a good deal on some wheels and tires. Well, a guy put this Jeep on that he was parting out and it had these wheels and tires on it. And I ended up getting a hold of the guy and I got him for a screaming deal. The guy was super cool. And they actually had one run on him on Tim Cameron's Rock Bouncer. So that's where these came from. to cut up the frame and I was scared to death I was 19 I'd never done anything like that and I know once you cut it there's no going back so I just made a mark and started cutting I did the back first it actually turned out a lot easier than I thought it was gonna be we used two by four rectangular tube that was 3 16 thick and I wanted it to come up. I wanted it to keep the contour of the stock frame, but I wanted to just keep going. I had a look in my mind that I really liked because I'd drawn it out a million times. And I really, really, really wanted this certain look. After I had mocked up the rear, I was pretty confident. I was feeling good. There was, there was nothing that really held me up. I didn't really make any mistakes because I took my time and I was ready to tackle the front. So I just dove in, chopped the front of the frame off, and then I was like, oh no, there's compound angles here. My steering box has got them out to this. I have a track bar that's got them out to this. The axle can't hit it. Where's my grill go? It was like. The front was so intimidating for me, but piece by piece, Cut it off, change it, cut it off, change it, get Brady's opinion. But pretty soon, we had it pretty close to where we wanted it. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm feeling like stuff's moving pretty good. I'm learning how to do it. And then... Tragedy struck. My parents sell their house and it sold in like three days. The market was hotter than could be. And I had nowhere for this Jeep to go and I had one month to get it out. <laughs> It wasn't even rolling. There was no axles under it at this point. And I had a month. So the time came for me to ask my oldest brother if I could bring it to his brand new shop, his new house. There wasn't a speck of dust on the garage floor. There were signature signed legal documents written, notarized by the title company, that every tool I touch, every day after it's done, the garage is swept. It was like a full-on legal document. I've never seen anything like it. 38 pages long. You guys don't get it. This is Brady. This guy vacuums the cracks in his garage. Those are empty. That's who we're dealing with here. Trying to build a Jeep, there's parts strung out everywhere. If you've ever built one or seen one being built, parts are everywhere. But you gotta make do. It was either go to the storage unit get sold or it goes to Brady's and I learned how to clean up after myself. That happened, my parents sold their house in December of 2020. And I promised Brady it would be done in three months. <laughs> we pulled it out of the garage for the very first time on its own power on April 5th, 2022. So it took an extra two years on accident. So at this point, I have this LS60 sitting there and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna tear it apart. I'm gonna put new seals. I'm gonna put new head gaskets on it. And I'm just gonna freshen it up, right? 
thinking, oh, maybe I'll even get the valves redone. I know a guy that can do them for cheap. I might just get the valves redone. So I pull these heads off. And in cylinder number one, there's a huge nest thing that had been growing in there. This motor had been sitting for probably 10 years. And I'm like, this guy told me that it had like 30,000 miles on it. So at this point, I'm like, well, I have to rebuild this motor for sure. Now I'm really wondering about the tranny. Cause if the motor looks like this, is there like nests and mice in the tranny and stuff, right? So I'm like, well, we'll figure that out when we get it, put it in gear and it doesn't work, we'll fix it. I decided, you know what, we might as well, while we're here, build the motor. What it started out as was a 2005 LQ4 6.0 liter LS motor. We took and turned the block into an LQ9. Basically all we did was take the dish pistons out and put flat top LQ9 pistons in it. Took it from a stock LQ4 and we took it up to an LQ9, which is a 10 point, shoot, 10.3 to one compression. So we started there with the block. We put new pistons, new rods, had new bearings put in it, and we did a new timing chain. We put a Brian Tooley stage one torquer cam in it because we didn't want a huge low for when you're up on a super technical obstacle, but we wanted to get some more power out of it. We took 706 heads off of a 5.3 that have a smaller chamber and we put them on it and the, the little bit smaller intake valve supposedly helps with a more efficient airflow. From what I understood, they did really well on these 6.0s. So we did that and it took the compression up from 10.3 to one to about 11.6 to one after they were decked and the head gaskets were on and everything was said and done. We had the motor mounted pretty well where it needed to go and we ran into a problem. We had nowhere for the exhaust to go because it couldn't go down and it couldn't go straight back. It would hit the firewall if it went straight back and it couldn't go down because I have an upper link that's right there, right next to it. And the reason is because the Jeep sits so low that everything is sucked up so high, it left no room for the exhaust. So we had to flip the headers up upside down and run the exhaust up like a turboed diesel truck, like a power stroke basically. And these run down and meet, and then they go up over the transmission and back down to the muffler, and then out the tailpipe to the back of the Jeep. Why don't you make, make a real quick thing right now that this is not finished wiring? Oh yeah, nobody judged the wiring on here. I think we literally had three days that we actually dedicated to wiring, and it normally should take about two weeks, so. None of this wiring is how it's gonna stay. We got this water bottle here from bleeding the power steering still hanging out in there. Everything's covered in dust, it ain't clean. So, but you get the story. You're getting, you're getting the point here of what, what was going on. The reason that we didn't cut the firewall out for the exhaust, because I mean, we, we pretty easily could have, but I really on this Jeep wanted to make sure that if I ever rolled it over, that if I ever destroyed the body, it wouldn't be a super big pain to go get another TJ body, paint it, and throw it back on. Didn't want to have a bunch of custom stuff all over the tub to where it would make it really, really, really hard to replace if I needed to. So this steering box played probably the biggest role in this Jeep build. The thing that we concentrated on the most was the steering. This steering box is out of a 1978 Ford Bronco. It's an outside mount, obviously forward-facing pitman arm steering box. Most TJs have the steering box mounted on the inside of the frame. And the reason that we went to this box is so as this axle travels up, this pitman arm and sector shaft and the whole bottom of the steering box could come clear to this truss instead of being stopped on top of this. It also made for a longer drag link, which helped our steering geometry I couldn't figure out how to get a stock pitman arm to work with this setup. I just, that would not work. So I cut the splines out of a stock pitman arm and then I put them in a sleeve that's this piece of DOM back here. And then I built this double shear twisted pitman arm literally just out of plate steel. It's quarter inch thick 
and it's all gusseted on the inside here for strength. It's double shear for this hind joint for strength. I'll probably end up doing weld washers on it at some point as well. And if you have any more questions on it, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook, message us. I'll give you my number, we can call and talk about it, and I'll give you all the information you want about why this steering setup was good for this Jeep and how it could possibly work for yours. We ported it right here and right here for the hydro assist. And we're running a PSC 10 inch throw ram on the front of this for the hydro assist. We had them custom stop it at nine and three quarters because that is what our tie rod was throwing. So we're optimizing all 50 degrees of steering that comes with the Super Duty axle. For the brakes, we're running a power stop brake kit. The caliper is power stop. The rotor is a drilled and slotted power stop rotor. The reason that we went with this is because, to be honest, Ford engineered it and we wanted to run an 05 Super Duty Hydro Boost on it. So they work together, it's how it came on the truck, it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And it was pretty cost effective as well. If you could see behind my huge face, this gauge back here, you're probably like, what the heck is that? So we actually threw an onboard air system on this Jeep to run the lockers and to air the tires. So if you check this out, this York compressor comes on a lot of different vehicles in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it starts out on the truck as an AC compressor. And we ported and converted it to pump compressed air. So it fills a tank that runs our lockers, it can air up the tires, and it, it airs stuff up really, really, really fast. We're running a 14 inch rad flow coil over, it's a 2.5, and on the front, we're running a 250 over 300 spring rate. We're still working on the shock tuning. Uh, they might be a little stiff, but when you're going really fast, I honestly like the feel of it. But I'm not a shock tuner, so if you know anything better, and you're like, oh, that's way too heavy, tell me what you think in the comments. We're also running a Fox 2.0 air bump. The reason that we decided to do these air bumps is when you hit something really hard in a, a really fast impact, your shock shaft goes up, the shock dampens it, the springs collapse, and if you don't have anything to bottom out on, you'll end up hitting all sorts of crap. So these are your last resort bump, and they slow down that compression so you don't get a hard thud it takes it and slows it down. They work really, really well. I'm not the best one to describe how they work, but if you have questions about these, jump on YouTube. There's people that tell you all about them. I have been trying to decide and design a roll cage since I was like 12 years old. I'm not kidding. This took so much thought. I have so many pictures of different design ideas, and this is what I came up with to be exactly what I wanted it to look like. If you look in here, who was chewing sunflowers here? Got coil pack. Don't mind the mess. Wow. But this Where's, B pillar, what? Where's all your bolts? What are you talking, we don't need those. Those just tie into the tub. If this B pillar comes in here. We actually used a moto built kit for the roll cage tie-ins. And then we have this crossbar in between the two B pillars. This piece here supports the frame tie-in. So this right here ties directly into the frame and there's just a little polyurethane bushing in between. We took this A pillar down through the dash and then we tied it into the floor right there. This comes down and it blocks the ducting on this air vent right here. But Brady and my dad kind of designed this air duct and completely redesigned the ducting system back here. So it actually works, believe it or not. You might recognize this if you own a TJ or an LJ. This is the factory Jeep top. So we placed this B pillar right where the factory one was. So the factory soft top works with this and the little door surrounds here that your uppers close into they bolt up into the top of this cage and they work as well. Also, these little sun visors, they still work on here. Brady busted the other side on accident trying to help. That's all right. This is a Wet Sound Stealth 10 sound bar that I actually got for Christmas. I don't have that kind of gitas to just drop on a sound bar. So real grateful for that. That keeps our Morgan Wallen going real loud. This was a pain to figure out 
If you look, there is compound angles like crazy on this piece to get it far enough over for this coil over to mount in here. This is the original piece that comes all the way from the A pillar. It comes down, swoops right here, picks up on the other side, and this is all one piece on that tube. This was the best thing that I could come up with that, that, that tied it in and made it look decent. Honestly, this took a straight week of figuring out how to get these tubes to perfectly get notched into one plate. On the rear, we're running the same Radflow 14 inch coil over. It's a 2.5 on the rear as well. We're running a 200 over 300 spring rate. Is when I was little, all the Jeeps that were around were CJ7s. So I wanted to run a CJ7 tailgate on this. And <laughs> we, these, these are modified hinges here because the CJ7 hinges mount really low. And we have this bumper sucked clear up and we barely can get these bolts in, but it works. Right here, we're running glow shift gauges. This is an oil temp, tranny temp, and air pressure. Um, in here, we're running the PRP seats. I built a bracket to make them run on the factory TJ sliders. The reason that I wanted to do this stock TJ sliders is a, a five-year-old could drive this thing with how far it can slide up. And if Shaquille O'Neal wants to drive it, he can too. On the center console, this is color matched to the Jeep. These are our cutting brakes for the both rear tires. Obviously an art car shifter with the wide open design knob. We are huge fans of anything wide open design, so I had to have something on here. So on here, I have this main power switch shut off. See my gauge come on. This right here is my tranny cooler fan. This is my air compressor clutch. And then these two are just auxiliary for whatever I wanna plug them into. These are air brake switches off of a semi that run our front, our front and our rear locker. We got some cup holders in here for tasty beverages. The computer is mounted underneath here and I have an access right here and an access in the back that you can't see. We are running the stock Jeep TJ gauges and they actually all work. So honestly, there's a lot better way to do it. Um, I think aftermarket gauges are a good idea. This was just a really simple and clean. It didn't take very much effort. We're running the Novak TAC emulator and we're just running a GTJ speedometer sensor in the Atlas. The Atlas that we're running is an Atlas II 4.3 to 1 gear reduction. On the drive lines, I've had a ton of drive line problems. On my old Jeep, I had a two piece front drive line. So when it was in four wheel drive and I'd floor it on a sand hill, it felt like we was taking off, getting right out of the stratosphere in a rocket ship. I felt like I was gonna get shish kebab by the front drive line coming through the floor and I was gonna end up on the smoker by the end of the day. They were super, super, super intimidating for me and I was just gonna piece them together but Brady's like, uh-uh. We're not dealing with driveline issues. We're not dealing with having to be worried about them. So we called up Adam's drivelines. It made them so, so, so easy. And honestly, it was worth every penny, but they were super affordable. Like we added up how much it was gonna cost to just piece them together. And we, we would have saved like a hundred bucks to maybe piece them together. And then who knows if they're gonna actually hold up. Adam said, Hey, if you have problems with them, you give us a call. On all four of the joints, there's CV flange on the axles and on the Atlas. And that gave me a super big peace of mind because that connection, it would be as strong as I would want it to be. And that right there sums up my G. For all these years, your little brother has always kind of been the kid that you just, you wanted to wipe a booger on or, you know, I'm happy. yeah, just crop dust him whenever it's possible. But at this point in time, he is outdone big brother, big time. And I had to get rid of all my Jeeps because of this one. I knew what this Jeep was gonna turn out to be. I drew this Jeep multiple times. I wanted this Jeep and this little guy little goes really? and builds it. Okay? Really? He gives up just about dang near everything he has to own this Jeep and to build this Jeep. So that means, I'm no longer trying to beat him 
I'm trying to keep up with them now. You guys are, if you liked this Jeep, the builds on this and the things that were going on, we've got a whole brand new build that is going to be similar but different with a serious Peck Brothers flare on it. And we're gonna take everyone along for the ride. This Jeep, you only got to really see the finishing touches, the ending products. You kind of got to see a lot of the final assembly. You're gonna see from start to finish what it takes to build a completely custom Jeep LJ. So that's the plan. This is wrapped up. You'll see this Jeep plenty still. We have a few little things to finish up on it, really boring stuff. But once that's done, it's full bore on this LJ because we have got to get it done. We cannot be missing any more wheeling trips mm -mm. and we got to put a timeline on it. We probably might as well tell them now. There's no such thing as a timeline on a Jeep at all. I learned that really fast. Caleb's took over two years, just over two years. Mine is going to be one year. One year, at least from now. I have some parts figured out. But one year from now, mine will be done. So you guys better stay tuned because the next video you're going to want to see about the design phase on this Jeep LJ. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe or share this video with your buddies. And this has been a special, special episode of Peck Brothers Off-Road.